Hi, my name is Brandon Drake. I want to thank, uh, in particular, uh, Jan Dressen, Sam Jusret, and all the other folks who've worked very hard to bring us all together here today. Today, I'd like to talk about magnitude and impact with regard to the late Bronze Age collapse, specifically trying to get a perception as to the scale of the climate changes we see here. As has been discussed earlier in some of the comments, the term climate change is very nebulous. You need some kind of reference point to really get your footing to understand what kind of changes are occurring. So, to begin, I want to take you back to the year 1620, where in Turkey there were significant problems. This is in the midst of the Little Ice Age. We see at the beginning uh, a series of droughts effect at the tw uh, toward the end of the 16th century. And then well into the 17th century, in response to these droughts, we start to see lots of internal rebellions, uh, uh, primarily the Chiliacs. In this case, as these rebellions incur more and more and more, you see the Ottoman Empire investing more and more res uh, resources to combat these revolutions and thus dividing out royal power. And on the periphery, we start to lose control. And here, nomadic groups, uh, which include Bedouins and Tatars, began to nibble away at former farmland. And what you see is a large degradation of Ottoman authority. This quote from a chronicler at the time notes that there was such a cold that the Istanbul Bosphorus froze. And without ships, many of the men crossed over ice to Ushkundar, Galata, and Kasampasha on foot. In that same city, some men froze from the severe cold and died. The earth was covered in snow. Famine invaded, and the man who could get any bread for a dirham counted himself lucky. The historian Sam White noted that uh, uh, climatic events were, the, uh, uh, were, the, were one of the primary motivators for these events for the Ottoman Empire. They noted that first you start with, uh, uh, with unusually cold weather, then you see increased aridity, then you see famine as agricultural produ production drops, you see the farmland less able to supply urban centers with food, you see more uh, uh, destabilization of central control, and then the periphery starts to nibble away. And this effect actually, and the, fact, and the effects of this period lasted for centuries. One of the reasons the Ottoman Empire started so strong in the 15th century and lost a lot of its control in world affairs later on was because of the population stress from these time periods. Population in Anatolia never really recovered from this point. While population soared in the rest of Europe, Anatolia was left a little bit behind. Now, I want to now direct our attention to uh, the uh, publication of the Little Ice Age. This is based on a quick entry into ISI Web of Knowledge to see how many articles contain a Little Ice Age in the title. Here we see the number is 7,158. This makes sense. We have lots of historical records. It's, a, uh, it's an event that has multiple climate, re climate records that overlap and agree with each other. So we see lots of research on it. A similar, uh, a much more severe event, the Younger Dryas, much deeper in antiquity, has about 9,805 articles. Now let's come to the late Bronze Age collapse, what we're here to discuss today. 59, in ISI Web of Knowledge. This does not include many of the edited works by, by colleagues in this room that are in, that are in books, but in for terms of peer-reviewed articles, we don't see the same kind of research focus on this event, which is quite surprising because we see some of the greatest climatic impacts associated with this event. So there's a clear demand for a lot more research. And I think one of the reasons we see so much ambiguity today about this subject is so little primary work has been done. It's really only the past five years that we see folks like Kaniowski and, Le and Legut uh, uh, deriving primary empirical data that identify this period rather than just the theoretical. So just to give you a sense of scale, and we'll see if this is a laser pointer. It's not a laser pointer. Does this have a laser pointing function by any chance? Uh, it has to be UFA. Okay, never mind. We'll be all right. So in any case, this is the uh, uh, just two temperature record for the past 2,000 years. You see the younger dryas there at about 11,000, and then the Greek Dark Ages are one of those small little peaks there. So here's an example where climate reference points are important. In the vast scheme of things, the events we see in the Holocene are not very large climatic events, certainly not in the context of the uh, greater Pleistocene. So understanding what a little wiggle in the Holocene means for human civilizations is a very important task. And it's not one that's directly evident based on the climate records. Now, uh, typically speaking, we see climate studies focusing on one of two types of events. First, we see uh, a focus on historically documented climatic events. Second, we see focus on extremely severe climatic events that show up in multiple proxy records. The things that fall in the middle the mid to low magnitude events that might have affected past human societies don't receive the same kind of attention, particularly when historic, primary historical records are not available. 
Now, I want to turn to one of the ideas uh, uh, of our own current time, which is anthropogenic global warming. And uh, based on the International Panel on, on Climate Change, one of the key problems is this. How big does a climatic event have to be to severely impact a human society? And this is a surprisingly difficult question to answer because there's no one data source that addresses this. This requires integration from multiple fields. Now, one thing I want to comment on, uh, specifically with regard to what Sam and Joseph, uh, said earlier, even a small earthquake can cause tremendous damage to poorly constructed buildings. So even a small pe uh, period of climate change can have a severe impact on a population that is not prepared for any variation. So it isn't just a question of how strong the climate event is based on our paleoclimate proxy records, but how well prepared that society is to handle it, whether it's through its agricultural system or its own infrastructure. Now, the IPCC di uh, differentiates these terms out using two terms. First, magnitude. This refers to the severity of a climatic event or process based on its own merits in a paleoclimate proxy record or in a global circulation model. Impact, however, refers to the effect that, that, that a given climate event has on a human society. So we have magnitude and we have impact. What I want to stress today is that magnitude is a question addressed via paleoclimatic records. Impact is one addressed by archaeology. And understanding the cross-section between these two is critically important. It is very possible to have a very low magnitude, clima uh, imp uh, ma magnitude climate change have an outsized impact on a human society that is vulnerable to either that change in precipitation or that change in temperature. Now, there's no question that an event like the Younger Dryas would have a severe effect on human societies. But unfortunately, we don't have a comparable event affecting any kind of agrarian-based civilization. So as such, we have to drift our attention towards different types of records. The problem is the kind of Holocene fluctuations we see that have affected human societies are not the easiest ones to pick out in regional records. So we, we run into a dilemma. Local climate records always provide better insight than global records, specifically when we're talking about specific human societies. However, these records tend to be low resolution, somewhat ambiguous, and difficult to reconcile with human chronologies. On the flip side, we have global climate records that present high resolution and clear impacts throughout uh, the Northern Hemisphere. But these are not as easily relatable to specific areas. Microclimate is an extremely important factor, and so it's really hard to go from the extremely general, broad global models to something small, such as a specific tell in Israel or in Greece. For today, I want to focus on uh, comparing and contrasting the events of the Late Bronze Age and Greek Dark Ages with other Holocene fluctuations to at least get a benchmark of as to what kind of scale of event we're looking at. So as a consequence, I'll only discuss uh, global climate records today, but this is not to suggest that they are in any weeds superior or even adequate to the question of specific uh, archaeological impacts. Now, as I'm sure will be covered quite extensively over the next two days, we see in the 12th and 11th centuries BC, the Eastern Mediterranean is subject to abandonment and lots of population migrations. Uh, you'll see a couple terms bandied around. The first is uh, collapse of individual cities and abandonment. The other is migrations of people known as the Sea Peoples. These two events are about separate, at least the Sea Peoples are introduced about 50 years before we start to see wholesale abandonment. But nonetheless, it's generally agreed that they're, par that they're linked somehow. Uh, and so as a consequence, that opens up our scale for the time period we're looking at. Now, the early work I, uh, I relied on uh, when I first got interested in the subject was looking at sea surface temperature records. This is mainly because most cyclogenesis in the Mediterranean occurs within the Mediterranean. That is to say, the Mediterranean is its own moisture source. As a result, uh, the, the system is highly dependent upon sea surface temperature records. If you have, uh, so to discuss Mediterranean climate, you have hot, dry summers and cool, wet winters. In a hot, dry summer, you have warm sea surface temperatures, but you also have a warm air that can retain that moisture and transport it some distance. There, uh, uh, one of the interesting phenomena is that the Sahel of Africa seems to get a lot of the precipitation that is evaporating out in the summer. However, uh, if you have colder sea surface temperatures, uh, well, in, anyway, before I get too ahead of myself, in the winter, however, the air pressure cools, but the sea surface temperatures stay rel relatively resistant. So as a consequence, the air drops its moisture load a little bit more quickly and a little bit more locally. So this is one of the reasons you see, one of the, one of, one of the many reasons you see increased precipitation in the winter. Now, this is predicated on the difference between evaporative potential of the sea and the atmosphere. 
If we have colder sea surface temperatures, we see less evaporation, just as a colder cup of coffee is going to evaporate less than a warm cup of coffee. And that has long-term impacts over precipitation cycles. So a sustained decrease in sea surface temperatures would presumably, based on what we know of the Mediterranean today, affect its overall precipitation. The problem... That's not right, because most of the temperature loss from the Mediterranean is due to evaporation. I'm not it's latent heat transfer, so you, you would expect your evaporation is potentially quite high, even if your air temperatures are low, but the, the actual drop in temperatures related to the latent heat transfer to the atmosphere, so it's an evaporative. Yeah, that's, a, that's a fair point. That's a fair point. Thank you. I'd also like to point out that even in making this kind of interpretation based on this data is very difficult for this time scale, because if we look, the distance in these data points we see entire abandonment of cities between two points of data. So it's extremely hard to reconcile these chronologically. Point being, these are potentially very insightful for climate in the region, but the resolution isn't sufficient. Again, this is one of the dilemmas we see with local climate change proxies being used in archaeological questions. The resolution sometimes doesn't quite catch up. So this is one of the many reasons I wanted to look at global climate change proxies for two reasons. One, they're sufficiently high resolution. Second, we at least get a benchmark of comparison for better documented uh, time periods, in particular the Little Ice Age. Here, colored are the various events of the, of the Late Bronze Age collapse. We see the introduction of the Shardana and the uh, 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 Karniak Temple inscription. We see the Battle of Kadesh. These occur right about there. And then we see the relatively rapid uh, final occupation layers of multiple cities mapped out. What you'll notice is that these cities occur during a period of, uh, of rapid temperature loss in the Northern Hemisphere, at least as recorded in Greenland. Again, this is Greenland, not the Mediterranean, so this is only an associational identification. Nonetheless, we do see that in the Northern Hemisphere, we do have relatively rapid temperature loss. And as, a as an interesting point, if you measure from the top of that point of change at the Bronze Age climatic optimum to the bottom, that is the sharpest temperature drop in the past 6,000 years. In fact, it's the largest magnitude event that has occurred in the past 6,000 years period in terms of beginning and ending temperatures. So there was clearly climatic fluctuation going on in the context of the late Bronze Age collapse. One of the things I'd like to highlight about this time period, here colored blue is our period of the late Bronze Age collapse, and in green, the period associated with the Greek Dark Ages. In orange, we see our descent from the medieval warm period optimum down to the Little Ice Age, which is colored in light blue. You notice that both time, in both cases, you have a sharp temperature decrease, but then you also have a plateau of lower temperatures following it. What I'd like to point out is that human societies, uh, spe specifically those relying on urban development, are very dependent on agricultural production. So as a consequence, relative changes in temperature can have a huge impact on them. And at least in this regard, the Little Ice Age and Greek Dark Ages share this as a similarity. One other record I'd like to uh, highlight is the intertropical convergence zone. Uh, this is a band of cyclones mentioned by Simon Josseret that is driven by the warmest sea surface temperature records on Earth. It has been proposed that southward movement of this zone is one of the factors which weakens the Indian monsoon. One of the best records for this is the Carriaco Basin, which is an anoxic marine zone. Its varve sediments record variations in atmospheric 14C used in radiocarbon dating curves. The reason for this is in an anoxic marine basin, basin the primary input for sediments is often plankton, which, which fall and die. With the photosynthetic plankton will incorporate 14C while they're alive, and thus an anoxic basin means low carbon recycling, which means you've got, a decent marine, you've got a decent body of evidence to look at atmospheric fluctuations in 14C. However, these same environmental parameters preserve uh, other, other records as well. I'd like to highlight titanium concentrations in particular. Titanium concentrations tend, uh, in the Carioca Basin have been argued to reflect river discharge. The more rain you have over Venezuela, the more river discharge you have, and thus the more titanium is transported into the Carioca Basin. Conversely, the less rain you have, the less river discharge you have, and thus less titanium. The primary precipitation force in the zone is the ITCZ. So uh, uh, folks have argued that this is one of the, the, the ways to look at uh, changes in the ITCZ. So here we look at the record of the ITCZ. Our x-axis is titanium concentrations uh, in the basin. What we see are there are two periods when we have a systematic, at least according to the authors, southward displacement of the ITCZ. The first is during the Little Ice Age. Uh, 
The second is associated with the Greek Dark Ages. Now this is systematic decline. There's also another point uh, in the, uh, around 400 to 600 AD, but not quite as severe. So here too, we see another similarity between the Late Bronze Age collapse and the Little Ice Age. Both see a systematic change in the intertropical convergence zone. And once again, to clarify, same colors, dark blue represents Late Bronze Age collapse, dark green indicates uh, Greek Dark Ages, orange indicates the medieval warm period, and then light blue indicates the Little, I the little Ice Age. Again, what we see is we see, in addition to a sharp temperature drop and a plateau for northern hemisphere temperatures, we also see at, uh, a, strong, uh, a sharp decrease in titanium deposited here, which has been argued to be reflective of, of southern placement of the ITCZ. So in this case, the collapse of late Bronze Age societies does occur in the context of yet another uh, uh, climatic signal. An additional record that has been highlighted by, uh, by Rowling, Minford, and other folks is the uh, ratio of potassium uh, in just two ice records. This reflects non-sea salt being deposited. The argument is that, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, the argument is that increased non-sea salt or potassium is reflective of an, of an increased intensity for the Siberian high. What I want to focus on exclusively here is simply that we see two peaks for this uh, non-sea salt being deposited in, in the GISP-2 record. The first is during the time of the Greek Dark Ages. The second is during the, uh, the Little Ice Age. So again, we see a parallel between these two periods. I think it's North Atlantic storminess that, that's been turned <coughs> down. It's yeah. essentially picking up... Yeah? No? No, the, the potassium is, is, is coming in. In this case, we're quite strongly de uh, demonstrates it comes from China. So the potassium, it's the, it's the sodium. That's the North Atlantic yeah. storm and the sea ice cover. There's sea salt and non-sea salt, and they both reflect different, yeah. So in any case, um, the argument here is that this reflects an intensification of the Siberian high specific to the potassium record. And again, this dynamic may have been similar between the Greek Dark Ages and the Little Ice Ages, and the Little Ice Age. Now, the big missing data set, and I would be thrilled if someone can point me in this direction, is a solid proxy for the North Atlantic oscillation that can extend back to 3,000 uh, 3, BP or the Middle and Late Bronze Age. This is one of the largest climate forcers in the Mediterranean region, but it lacks a really good long-term proxy record, at least any that I'm familiar with. Now, in lieu of that, we can look at glacial advances in Europe, at least in the uh, Great Aleutian glacier, glacier in the Alps. Here, we see the Little Ice Age uh, along the y-axis shows a more lower latitude placement of these glaciers. So, you, so the higher these peaks, the, more gla the, the, the stronger the glacial advance. We see strong glacial advances associated with the Little Ice Age, uh, the early Iron Age, the Greek Dark Ages, and also that same period we saw earlier uh, in 400, 600 uh, AD. So the same periods where we see the ITCZ shifting south based on the Carrico Basin, there's an overlap with these records. And if you look at the GISP-2 record, we also see generally lower temperatures as well. So I do think we're seeing broad changes in atmospheric circulation that tie the events we see in the Little Ice Age with the events later seen earlier in the Greek Dark Ages. So in this, I would argue that the Greek Dark Ages are similar to the Little Ice Age in that they represent low temperature plateaus relative to a preceding warm period. They both occur contemporaneous with an unusually southward placed position of the ITCZ, and they both happen during intense activity of the Siberian high. Now, just for, to compare, I decided to line these two periods up. We see at zero, at the very top of the y-axis, is the absolute peak in just two temperatures, in light blue for the, for the medieval warm age, and dark green for the Bronze Age climate optimum. Now, these are relative to each other. The real difference between these two is about three degrees centigrade. There's actually quite a, the Bronze Age optimum was considerably warmer than the medieval warm period, at least based on just two. But nonetheless, we see the same basic pattern, and interestingly, a little bit similar timing, where you have a sharp temperature drop followed by a plateau. In this case, the Little Ice Age lasts, lasts longer, but then again, we're defining the Greek Dark Ages not based on, cli on climate, but rather based on human on, on, on uh, archaeology of the region. In any case, what I'd like to point out is based on a measure of severity, which is rate of change per year, the Greek Dark Ages are much sharper and higher magnitude than was the decline from the medieval warm period. So if we consider the historical effects of this transition in Europe, 
especially in light of Anatolia and the, and the Eastern Mediterranean, I think we have a rough analog for what we may have seen in the Great Dark Ages, with one important and major exception. I would argue that societies in the uh, medieval era were much better adapted and able to handle this than their Bronze Age colleagues, primarily because the agricultural and, uh, technology was far superior in the medieval era. So I would argue that the LBA collapse can be thought of as a rapid transition to the cooler Greek Dark Ages uh, relative to the warmer wa uh, Bronze Age optimum. Uh, same comparison, this with the ITCZ, just for a frame of reference. We have a lot lower resolution uh, in, the, in the late Bronze Age and Greek Dark Ages, but we see that the Greek Dark Ages were home to some of the uh, sharpest changes in ITCZ position, at least as reflected by Karyako Basin. I think more research will help clarify if this magnitude is an artifact of the data source or if it is measuring a real climatic factor. But nonetheless, you can see that these sharp changes would have had implications for precipitation. And whether we're talking about more arid or more wet conditions, the rapid transition to any climatic, to any, 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 any precipitation regime has implications for human infrastructure. So I would argue that it isn't necessarily whether it's wetter or whether it's more arid that's more important, but rather if the change is too rapid, it's harder for populations to adapt their technology and their subsistence strategies to cope. So in this case, change, not necessarily warm or wet, or dry or wet, is the enemy. So provided that the Karyako Basin titanium record accurately reflects ITCZ movement, the late Bronze Age and Greek Dark Ages showed considerably more uh, severe variation in precipitation patterns, potentially. So as a consequence, the Greek Dark Ages are generally colder and I would argue arid, but I think uh, hopefully there will be a lot more clarity after these next two days regarding this. Um, but I would also argue that the rapid changes we see had negative impacts for human populations in, this, in the area. Now, of course, in the context of the Holocene, these are not high magnitude events. These are very normal, average changes we see throughout the Holocene, which is one of the most stable climatic periods we see in the past 800,000 years, at least based on the Epica record. However, they, were, they did have severe impacts on populations living in the Eastern Mediterranean. Again, a perfectly small scale climate magnitude event would, could easily be missed by a climate researcher because, but be very noticed by archaeologists in the region. Now, I wanted to also comment, many sites show evidence for earthquakes being the source of destruction, destruction relatively unambiguously. But I think one of the key questions of the late Bronze Age is not how the sites were destroyed, but why they were not rebuilt after their destruction. Whatever the source of the destruction, humans, earthquakes, the inability to build back suggests there are significant changes to the way people are living. Now, finally, a discussion of process and event. An event is a discrete, is, is a discrete uh, uh, set of conditions. A process is a longer-term pattern of change. I would argue that what we see with the Late Bronze Age and the Greek Dark Ages doesn't really qualify as an event per se, at least not climatically, certainly with regard to the archaeology. The problem is, is we see an overall Holocene trend towards cooling temperatures. And, so as a con and humans adapt to these cooling temperatures with the way they interact with the landscape. So an event becomes a troublesome thing. It's very hard to find evidence of an event, but I would argue that we have clear evidence for a longer-term process that humans are responding to. So in any case, not necessarily a specific event, but rather the overlapping of several processes that create that unique perfect storm, perfect storm as Dr. Klein says, that had high impact on the human societies at the time. So Sam, historian Sam White suggested that the climatic fluctuations of the Little Ice Age resulted first in droughts, then in rebellions, and finally in sustained long-term depopulation within the Ottoman Empire. And this is a permanent hit, to the, uh, permanent hit to the Ottoman Empire. It's not hard to imagine that the more severe conditions we see earlier during the late Bronze Age collapse and Greek Dark Ages would have had similar, if not more severe, effects on those human populations. Now, of course, this isn't just an academic question. The IPCC has proposed a warming of 2 degrees centigrade as a warming target for the world to meet based on our current rate of anthropogenic projections. I would also like to note this is far too optimistic. This assumes immediate changes to our carbon infrastructure. I want to point out that the temperature change associated with the Bronze Age collapse was approximately two, uh, uh, it was about 2 degrees centigrade as well. So our most optimistic outlook for a human response to, cl to anthropogenic climate change corresponds to one of the most severe impacts we've seen with regard to a climate event. <laughs>
So it's worth considering uh, that archaeology has, should have a role to play with regard to how we set targets and what is acceptable in terms of uh, our own climate changes in our own time. And this is a key part of the discussion that I think is missing. If we judge climate by magnitude alone, we miss the factor of impact. And impact is what's most important to us. And just again, to give a sense of scale, here's the famous CO2 record of Epica combined with Mauna Loa. Here you see the peaks are the interglacials, the bottoms are the glacials. This variation is what is normal for the Pleistocene. The, uh, the Late Bronze Age collapse occurs at about zero, roughly zero. We're looking at a very large scale here. Uh, but you can see there's very little happening there climatologically compared to what has happened in the past. The CO2 emissions we've seen in just the past 100 years take us well past even Pleistocene variability. So again, with regard to our actions and our industry, it's worth considering what kind of climate changes aren't just possible, but can we actually handle as a society. In any case, thank you very much for your time, and I'm open to any questions you might have.